Now, yesterday, we went back into, well, no, I guess we went into the future. And then we came back into real life. And now we're going back into the future again. So let's discuss the SEC East coaches in five years from now. 2025, what will the SEC Eastern Division coaches look like? Um, And we'll start off with Florida. Uh, You want me to go ahead and start? Yeah. This is a very pivotal year, a lot of people say, for Dan Mullen, right? If he doesn't get it done this year, when is he going to get it done, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Look, I mean, they won 11 games last year. I was about to say, anybody who says that is an idiot. I, I don't think it is that important that you beat Georgia this season. He's going into his third year. He took a team that was four and eight and won 10 games with them in his first season. So, they won 11 the next year. Yes. You, get, you think it's your God given birthright to win 10 games every year. It's not going to work out well for you. I think Mullen is going to be just fine. I think he's going to stay at Florida. I think that is a destination kind of gig for him. I think in five years, he will still be there competing for SEC East championships and probably national championships. What, I completely you- agree with that. 100%. I, I like making fun of Dan because he is goofy and funny and weird. But I make fun of him because I like him. I do. I do like him a lot. That's eight. Hey, I I completely forgot. Uh, let's see. The Brown Yeti said, uh, "No, Matt. Matt jumped in. YouTube is working now. I don't know what the hell's going on with this chat." Uh, he said, "There's a difference between catching and dying. Asymptomatic people are not dying." Uh, the Brown Yeti asked if it was still ACC versus SEC. Michael said, "Mayo over Miracle Whip." Yeah, I could agree with that. And Brown, Brown Yeti said, uh, WCE Murder Hornets Bowl. I think we can pull it together. And Matt said, I agree with the Murder Hornets Bowl. Yeah. I got $200 right now. I'll buy one of those bowls. I can get down with it. I can get down with it. All right. So, we went through Dan Mullen. Let's jump into Georgia. I think Kirby Smart will still be the coach at Georgia in five years. I don't think I he's do going not. anywhere. I think he may go through a couple more offensive coordinators between now and then. But the way that he is building that thing, I don't think there's any reason Hang for on, him to go anywhere. That doesn't make any sense. Hang on. You think they're going to have more talent in the future than they've had in the past two to three years? No, because I think they'll can. continue That's to get That's not possible that. for them to have more talent than they've had the last three or four years. I'm not sure what I said to make you think that You I said was... he's the way he's building that thing, as if it's not already built. Well, they haven't won a title yet, so they're, they're well, no, still... That, and you know why they haven't won a title? Because Kirby Smart is their head coach. You have the lead that you had, they had in the national championship game against Alabama. You, A good coach, a great coach doesn't lose that game, okay? Yeah. In in the, uh, uh, the playoff game in which you had to face Alabama and you make the bumbling mistakes while you're dominating them once again for the first half, a great coach doesn't make – he lost those games. Those players didn't lose those games. The other coaches didn't lose those games. He makes decisions that cost his team games, and he will every game. He's going to do it every game. So where do you think he will be in five years? I think – I don't know, but he will be fired. Because at some point in time, really? the talent is not going to win 10 games a year. And they are going to see how much they are spending. They are going to see what they are getting for it. And every time he got close, he cocked it up. I mean, I can't really argue with you. Um, and I don't. I don't foresee that. I think Florida is getting better. I think Tennessee is getting better. Okay. So at some point in time, they're going to finish in five years. At some point in time, they're going to finish third in that division. And when that happens, that will not go over well. I mean, they, they they let Mark Richt, well, but they weren't putting as much into the program, I guess. Eh. Not, not, not close to the amount in the program. Also, Mark Richt was an exceptional human being. I do not believe Kirby to be that. Yeah, you might have a point. Okay, okay. I, I see where you're now, coming this from. Is a lot of my biases of just not liking him coming out, and I just don't see how he recruits the way he recruits outside of the fact that I understand that a large sums of money is involved. I, I just – there's no way that guy could walk into my my living room and convince me to want to go play for him. I I can't disagree with anything that you're saying. 
My thought process is he, they will never be bad enough that he will be fired within the next five years. Oh, um, come come in third two years in a row in the East and and see if they don't throw his ass to the curve. I mean, we'll we'll see. Call Les Miles and ask what happens when you come in third one time. One time. He came in third multiple times, didn't he? Not not once they got to the national championship level. I mean, I guess he won a title, made it back to a title. Never really came in third. Always either beat Bama or, uh, uh, well, never really Bama, but consistently beat Auburn. Yeah. And if they didn't beat Auburn, Auburn lost to somebody else a couple of times where it didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got a point. Come in, come, come, come in third two years in a row and see what happens. I think uh, I think Kirby will still be there. You obviously disagree, and not. that is okay. Um, let's jump on to Kentucky. Mark Stoops. He's already been there for, what, seven seasons now? Six seasons? Yep, for a while. Uh, a good little while. I I believe that he is going to get a bigger job somewhere yeah. else. I don't know where. Somebody's calling him. You know, I, I think had he been offered Florida State, had the timing been right, I think he would have taken that gig. Um, but I think there's a multitude of jobs that are that are bigger than Kentucky that he will probably go to eventually. Yep. so that he will have a shot at winning a championship. I think that is I, important. I believe we're going to see a lot of changeover in the ACC over the next year or two, and I think he's going to be on – being on that side of the SEC um, and in Kentucky, I think there are a lot of ACC schools that know him well, know his resume well, and and will be calling him. And they, now they're going to have to pay him. They're going to have to pay him a ton. Yeah, but all those schools have money. Yeah, it's it's just because the ACC does not pay like the SEC. I'm just no, you but know. they've got money. Well, and, and I think a lot of them are going to start. I think a lot of athletic directors are realizing, you know, three million dollars ain't ain't go cut it. Yeah, anymore. It, ain't, it ain't working for us. So, yeah. like, I, I could see. I mean, this may be crazy. Like, Mac Brown could be leaving in a few years. Yeah, he's not. Mac Brown can't can't be can't there forever. Be there so forever. We're talking five years from now. So, yeah. you know, is North Carolina a bigger job than Kentucky? Yes, yes. I think it is. I think well, you get better you're in talent. the ACC and you're out of the SEC. That's the biggest thing. Um, let me let me tell you another thing that I could see happening. Um, old Lincoln might not last forever at Oklahoma as soon as the NFL just continues to beat down that door. That's true. And I could see them saying, well, one Stoops was pretty good before. Let's that's, call another one. That's true. Let's call another one. That's a big boy job there. Yes. Yes, it certainly that, that's is. That's a hoss of a job. I know that you don't like to talk about who might take over the job, no. uh, but I've got a couple of names. It's just impossible so. to do. I know, we, but it's still fun. I mean, it's impossible to figure out what these teams are going to do in five years. But Oh, no, no, it's not. You can definitely predict the the trajectory of an individual. Uh, but okay. To, to predict where they, who's going to take that over, you're talking about there's, there's 49 coaches out in the college football world. There might be a head coach – some quarterbacks coach that's never even put a headset on before that could that end up in five enough. years yeah. could be the next hot shit that, that, you know, Kentucky goes and gets. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, Sean Lewis is a name to pay attention to there. Uh, Kent state coach, you know, coached under Dino Babers. Uh, he's got that, uh, that offense down. He knows how to lead teams. Um, I think you'd be a lot of fun at Kentucky. So, I well, say the next coach at Kentucky is going to be whoever the quarterback's coach at Mississippi State is. You think so? I don't know. I don't know who the hell he is, but they're going to go get an air raid guy. That's a, well, and that's what Sean Lewis is. Like he's, well, okay, he, but but yeah. you, you're 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 putting a name to it, and I'm just guessing some guy that we've never heard of before. Missouri Eli Drinkwitz. I don't know what to think of this. He's a first time coach or first well first year coach here. Uh, it's only his second year coaching. He went thirteen and one at App State with a team that Scott Satterfield, you know, he took built. over a monster team, yes. and and that's a golden ticket that has paid off pretty well. Yes, that contract is sweet. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, I don't know what to make of this guy. I obviously I don't think that Missouri is built as well as App State was last year. Um, like he, we don't know if he can recruit. We don't know if he, you know, he. Obviously, he's been with some great coaches. Uh, he coached under Malzahn for a little. He's from that Malzahn tree. You know, uh, he has gotten it done in places that don't typically get it done 
before, right? So he, he has had success at App State. He's had success at Boise State. Now, these are both places that, that have built up a winning tradition, but you're still able to get players and still able to uh, kind of dominate in those spots. I don't, I don't know that Missouri is set up the same way as those. Um, if, I had, if I had to guess, like I think he will still be there in five years. But is there any real way to know? Uh, yeah, I, I think this is too big of a job for him. Based on his resume, he's just not prepared for SEC. I mean, we, we, listen, we saw this at, you know, at Arkansas. You, you go get a young guy who, who looks awesome, and he's done great at a smaller school and dropping balls deep in the SEC. You can do that in the ACC. You can do that in the Big 12. You can do that sometimes, sometimes in the Big 10. You can definitely do it in the Pac-12. You, you, that doesn't work in the SEC. That, that just doesn't work. Not and always. Especially at a school in which – they don't put large sums of resources in recruiting. That's the biggest um, thing. In their right. facilities. You're not getting a, – a, you are bringing a, a, a staff with you that is inexperienced in the SEC, trying to recruit in a state in which you have no local homegrown talent whatsoever. You're, you're just – you're getting the slums that didn't go to the Big 12 and the Big 10. That's not going to work in the SEC. I, I think mean, we, this guy is set up for failure. We've seen in the past, like James Franklin came into Vanderbilt, right? Yes. And did magnificent things. He was Maryland's offensive coordinator for years under Ralph Regan, came down those here. Are, those are rare things to and, happen. And that's what I was going to say is it is rare because Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida were all down at the same time. Right. And he was able to take advantage of that. And it, then took, he, it took a very yeah. unique situation. And, for and we don't all have all the stars and the moons to align to make that happen. Tennessee's on the rise. Georgia's at the top of the heap. Florida is right there. Um, you, you know, the, the, your cross rival is is A and M. That is no joke. Well, like, their their cross rival is Arkansas. So that's oh reasonable. Yeah, Missouri. I thought, I thought when them and A and M came in together, they were just cross rivals. No, no, no. It's uh, it's Arkansas and Missouri and A and M and South Carolina. Oh, well, then South Carolina got the short end of that stick, didn't they? You got they? that right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's let's a, rotate Arkansas off and let's get A&M. Thanks. It's, there you go. Uh, Brown Yeti said, um, uh, and you're one of the bottom four teams in the SEC. Uh, that definitely hurts. Uh, Damian Estrada jumped in. He said, uh, uh, what about Mike Singletary coaching in the SEC since nobody wants to hire him in the NFL? Uh, Can he recruit? Yeah, and, and not really a lot of ties down there, you know. Matt Miller jumped in. Hiring a coach from a place that just got their, uh, got their coach poached is never good because he inherited the previous coach's success and players. Yeah, that's – we were all surprised at the drink. If he was at App State two years and ran it back twice, I would feel a lot better about this. But, man, it's – look, I – I could be wrong. He could be the second coming of Scott Satterfield, and and we just all are wrong. That's fine. I'm I'm willing to be wrong, but I'm gonna take my chances with this ain't gonna work out. Yeah, I can I can understand it. I can understand it. Um, let's go ahead and dive into South Carolina. Um, I, I think Muschamp will probably be gone uh, very soon. Really, I just I don't think he can get that offensive side of the ball fixed. Uh, when you are playing Georgia, Florida, and Clemson every year, and Texas a and every year. Jesus, and, how did I not realize that? I pay yeah, close attention to South I Carolina. Mean, those four alone, and you've got Tennessee coming up, and you've still got to play Kentucky every year, and South Carolina has had miserable, miserable success against uh, against Kentucky. Like, you got to be able to win. And I don't think six Can anybody wins a year, win in South Carolina? I mean, Spurrier did. But I don't know if anybody can now because that was another one of those situations where Georgia and Florida were down, you know? Pretty unique situation. And so now that you've got the big wigs back on the up and up and everybody's Spurrier, spending money. Spurrier's only real tip of the cap in that era was dominating Clemson. Yes. I mean, he won five straight. And then Dabo got that thing rolling. So he also beat Georgia. Uh, well, they were like rolling pretty year. good, and he still went in there and beat him a couple times. Yeah. I mean, it's – look – that's what kept them out of the national championship conversation. I will say this. Those South, losses to South Carolina. South Carolina will never again, 
have three straight years where they were ranked in the top ten. That's just not going to happen. No, no. And so, but I, I, still, I think there are expectations there that they should at least be competing, um, you know, for better bowl games and whatnot. Like, if, if Muschamp was going eight and four every year, then or, or even seven and five, you know, with a few eight and fours, nine and threes thrown in there, like, he would be fine. Every They'd four years, statue. you need to fight for 10 wins. Yeah. I mean, that means, that's the bare minimum expectation of most coaches in the SEC is every four years, you need to, you, like, if Get you're to 10 wins. an Ole Miss, if you're a Mississippi State, if you're a, if every four years you can give me a beat your rival and, and, and a 10 win season, almost everybody that's not those top tier teams are, or will be fine with that. Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, Never go below six and six. And and beat the rival as much as you can, and every four years give us a ten win season. We're all okay. I know that you hate this. Uh, I think Will Healy is going to be the next coach at South Carolina. Like I convinced, he's the coach at Charlotte now. He was the coach at Austin P. Uh, young guy, you know. I he I think he's got ties there. I think he will eventually be able to kill it at South Carolina. And by kill it, I'm talking about what we just talked about for. For Muschamp, right? What would be a good expectation? I think Healy would be able to do that. So, um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, uh, so you you think that Muschamp will be gone as well, right? Uh, no, I don't know. I I, I kind of want to lean more towards he can make this thing last. It, it, mainly because I think the expectations at South Carolina are changing. I, I think mean, they're might... far enough removed from Spurrier to. That really they believe they're fighting for SEC title games. You might be right. And I think once your expectation changes, then, listen, a lot of it's going to depend on what it's going to cost to fire him. South Carolina is not a rich school. That's true. That's now, true. if he's on the last year of a deal, then, yeah, I could see him doing that. Or maybe one year, like, I could see him doing that. This is not going to be a situation where he's got three years and they're going to be paying two coaches for three years. That's that's just not going to happen in South Carolina. I don't, they don't have the the deep. They've got an incredible fan base, but they do not piss money away. No, you uh, you got a you got a good. This point is a there. team that went winless and brought their coach back. In December, the state reported that South Carolina, uh, Will Will Muschamp allowed them to cut his buyout. That is interesting. I don't know why you would ever do that. Uh, so, South Carolina football coach Will Muschamp gave up money to secure a raise for one of his most successful assistants. Uh, it means the game. Dude, that's could... big. Dude, man, I'll tell you this. I'd keep a guy just for that. Yeah, you got that right. Um, I mean, it's says... called loyalty. That's called trusting yourself. It's called trusting your staff. Let's see. This was this was just now, I December. like South Carolina. I'm prone to want good things for them. But at the end of the day, I don't care where that happens at. You've got a head coach that says, you know what? I'm going to make myself more vulnerable to being fired to make sure these other guys get paid. It means the Gamecocks coach will forego raises and his buyout will be cut by several million dollars. Figures released by the school Tuesday when the Board of Trustees approved the amendments and Mike Bobo's contract gave running backs coach Thomas Brown a raise from $300,000 to $500,000 a year and had his deal extended through 2021. It also took out Muschamp's annual $200,000 raise that was built into his contract. Uh, his salary will settle at $4.4 million a year, and it takes $3 million off the life of the contract. The buyout had been projected to be $15.58 million as of December 1st, 2020. Uh, that sets the new buyout at thirteen point four seven five on December 1st, 2020. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's got like three or four more years left on his deal. He's yeah. got a while. But just I'm gonna tell you, just because he's willing to do stuff like that, and this is not a COVID thing where we gotta save money for the school and everybody's hindering money. This is I gotta take care of my guys. Yeah. This is I'm willing to make myself more vulnerable to make sure these men that work under me are taken care of. Though that kind of stuff carries a lot of water with me, man. It just always has. I can understand it. I you know how I felt. I'm very uneasy about the Ed Orgeron hire at LSU. Okay. Yeah. Barry didn't really know how to feel about it. All right. And then I saw he took a very small deal to start off with. And is the reason he was willing to work for so little is not because he, he didn't think he was qualified to be paid more. 
It was to make sure his assistant coaches were highly compensated and they didn't lose anybody. And those guys not just didn't lose anybody, but had security in the job that they had. That stuff goes a long way with me, man. You, you yeah. got to make sure your people are paid and taken care of because you're only as good as them. Okay. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I agree. Um, so that, so we'll that makes me like Coach Boom a lot more. He's going to be there. Uh, Tennessee. I think this is a no-brainer. I think Jeremy Pruitt will be there. I, In five I, years, Jeremy Pruitt will win the will win the East at least once. I can believe it. Yeah, I, I think he's exactly what they need there, and he'll least. and he'll continually compete with Florida and Georgia in the next two years for that number one spot in the East. I think this year might be a little early. That's what I said. In the next two years, oh, in the next two, two years. More oh, years. I, I thought you were saying in, like for the next two years. No, so. in in two years. The next three of those five, he'll win one, and he'll be right there, game half, just like Alabama, Auburn, LSU. Just it'll be a weird ass round robin of who's who's going to get this. And I'll tell you the one nice thing about this: it sucks that Tennessee has to play Alabama every year. But but, but the other two schools in that division, none of them have a lackey. Florida has to play LSU. Georgia has to play Auburn, it, and it's the same in the West. At least all three of the big dogs that kind of always compete have a pretty good bite at it. So now I'm a little upset because we got a fourth big dog in A&M that is a sleeping giant, and they in South Carolina. Yeah. And that sucks. Yeah, no, you're right. But would it be any different if it was Missouri? No, it wouldn't be any different if it was Missouri. It's the same, it's the same concept. Yeah, the, same the thing. East has... Right now, Tennessee is head and shoulders beneath Florida and Georgia, yes. okay? Which is why Auburn and LSU fans have hated things for so long as Alabama gets a gimme W every year from the East, and we got to fight like hell for our win. Um, I don't believe that's going to be the same forever. I, I don't I think, think so Pruitt's either. got those things going. You know how I feel about him. I, I, I don't like him as a dude at all. I think this guy is an asshole and a prick. But I do think he can coach. Yes. Yes, I agree with you. I, I think Pruitt is a fantastic recruiter, uh, a fantastic coach, a fantastic leader. So I think he's going to be he's gonna be just fine. He'll be there in five years. Uh, Vanderbilt. I think Derek Mason could be gone as soon as – it probably won't be this year because of all the, you know, the pandemic situation and whatnot. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think the first chance they get, he's probably gone. I think last year he's gone if he doesn't pull off that monster win. What what monster win uh, was that? Oh, uh, what was it? Oh God, dang it! He gave like that awesome speech where everybody was just like, "Holy shit, Mar- Derek Mason's back!" Oh, it was, was uh, like, uh, Missouri. I'm the I'm the coach of this school. I'm the best man for this job. I mean, I was pumped. I, I remember nothing of that game. I watched zero of it. All I caught all all I caught was on Twitter the post game and his fire, and I was like. They ain't firing that guy this year, baby. It was it was Missouri, and it oh, was that uh, was that was after beating Missouri. Yeah, because Missouri had won like five straight games up to that point, and and they ended up winning that. Oh, that's game. right. Yeah, I remember that. They were so, on a roll, and then and then after that, like because let's see, they had lost to they lost to Georgia, they lost to Purdue, they lost to LSU, they barely beat Northern Illinois, they got stomped by Ole Miss, they got beat. I mean massacred at home by UNLV. Yeah, and then I they, the UNLV one was rough. Yeah, and then they turned around the next week and beat Missouri, who had won like wow. five straight games. Yeah, and it was a pretty great finish, if yeah. I believe, which is why it was as pumped as it was on the sidelines, Yep, that interview. And then the only game that uh, Vanderbilt won for the rest of the season was against East Tennessee State. Yeah. So... More than likely, like, had we not had all this stuff going on this if Missouri year, doesn't well, – yeah, because COVID didn't happen in December. If if they don't, he doesn't beat Missouri, he's fired before bowl season. Yeah. As soon as, as soon as game 12 is over, here's the papers. Thanks for the work, and we appreciate it. Yep. Um, but I, you're right. I think every coach, for the most part, unless you're a big-time program – everybody's going to get a little bit of leeway, a little bit more room in 2020. Yes, 100%. So I, I think he's probably gone after 2021. Uh, I do too. Name that I would love to see there that I think will uh, will take the job, 
Tony Elliott, who is the offensive coordinator at Clemson, he's been the co-offensive coordinator of the running backs coach. Um, I think he would be a fantastic fit. So Vanderbilt. let me ask you a question. Do you think Vanderbilt should ever try to get like a triple option type person there? Somebody who runs a gimmick offense that is really hard to compete with week in and week out. So when you only have one week to prepare for Vanderbilt, they could somehow sneak up and and, and beat somebody because they're just never going to be able to line up across the boards and hang with with the SEC the way – recruiting ACT scores, the, the, the quality of, of student athlete they have to get in there would work. Should they go to the military schools and grab, you know, one of those coaches? Cause that's what I, I would do if I was that athletic director, by the way, I don't think that's a bad idea because um, you, you, here's the thing. Those guys aren't losing to UNLV very often. They're not losing to, to, to East Tennessee. Like, you're going to win those games because you, A, run this weird gimmick offense that nobody's prepared for, and you're equal in talent, if not better in talent, than those schools. But every now and then, you can beat at least one or two big boys that just, for some reason, have just a – you have a great game, and they, in one week, turn around really hard to prepare for, you know, that a kind of matchup. Option. Yeah, And if you can win two conference huh. games and four pay-for-wins – that's bowl eligible. Yeah, I mean, if you get Jeff Munkin in there, you know, I, I mean, and Munkin is a fantastic I, And I think Munkin's more than just that gimmick offense guy. I think he could do more than that. But, but I think – But he obviously knows the gimmick like offense. That, yes. Bring something like that to the SEC, and, and maybe every now and then you trip somebody up. I like that idea. I mean, I really because do. Because playing a straight up, it's just not working. It's just you're yeah. never going to do it every five or six years. You might get two SEC wins if Ole Miss is down, and that's who your cross rival is. If, you know, if Tennessee or Missouri or, or South Carolina or Kentucky ever fall apart, they don't make a good hire after the next hire, you know. And that that's just trying to get bowl eligible, man. Yeah. That's okay. playing four scrubs just to get bowl eligible. Yeah, yeah, no, you're uh, you're right. That's what I would do if I was that AD. I like playing AD. If I was the Vanderbilt athletic director, there is no doubt in my mind. Yeah, you I, you understand. Monk, and and Monk the is the person I was thinking of. A, he's more gifted offensive mind than just running the triple option. I think he could open it up, and I do think there's a lot of local talent you could snag in Nashville and Tennessee. You, you just got to get them into school. Yeah. I mean, I think you'd have a lot of people that want to come to school there anyway. Um, That's right. And then if you just teach them this, like if they're not worried about, you know, playing in the NFL or whatever, then, I mean, obviously you will have uh, the ability to be able to teach them something like that. So, yeah, I like the idea. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. All right. I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Um, let's see. I don't see anything that has popped up. Nope, that's it. Um, I got I, nothing. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. All right, well, that will do it for today's show. Uh, as always, go over to winningcureseverything.com. Make sure you are subscribed everywhere that you need to be, uh, all the different live platforms and on the podcast. If you would, share the show out. Leave a nice review over at Apple Podcasts. Uh, and that's going to do it for today. You guys take care of yourself. Take care of each other. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.